Hi, this is Tim Gray, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion, and welcome to another wonderful episode of Phronesis. I want to pick up from where I left off last week. We're talking about the effect of loss. No matter how much you love God, irrespective of how much He loves you, irrespective of how you try to do everything right, loss, because we are operating in such a broken world, loss is an inevitability. And what do I mean by loss? I mean all kinds of loss, whether it is the loss of health, whether it's the loss of a business, the loss of a favorable relationship, uh, even, even the loss of a loved one. If we don't manage loss, because it's an inevitability, if we don't learn how to manage it, then its negative impact could change the trajectory of our experience. Last week, I mentioned two of the things that loss comes to do in our space that we must be aware of so that we can respond appropriately to them. If you missed it, go on the Fronesis Africa channel. If you missed it on DSTV, check on the YouTube channel, Fronesis Africa, the details are on the screen, and you can get last week's episode. I mentioned that one of the things that loss comes to do is distract you. This is big. You need to pay attention. What was I busy with before this loss came? A lot of times when loss shows up in our space, it's, it's because of its overwhelming negative emotion that it stirs up within us. The things that we're pursuing before we stop and then we become distracted. I know someone, for example, who was busy saving money for their business and then they lost a loved one. And, and, and I think it was a parent. Don't get me wrong. It was so important for them to do the best that they, were, they could do in order to bury that loved one. But guess what? Because of the impact of that loss, they took all the money that was going to advance their future and used it to bury the loved one. Some of you listening to me will be very offended and say, what were they supposed to do? I, let me tell you what I would not have done. I would have found an alternative plan, but I definitely will not have made that kind of decision that will compromise your future because of your current pain. Do not mortgage your tomorrow because of today's inconvenience. Uh, maybe we see things differently, but the point I'm still making, whether you agree with my example or not, is the fact that pay attention to what you were doing before the loss came and do not let the loss stop you from pursuing that dream that has been laid in your heart. Another thing I mentioned last week was the fact that loss has a way of bringing us to a place of isolation. Whenever we experience loss, if we don't manage it properly, you just find yourself wanting to be alone. You just want to disconnect from friends, disconnect from family, maybe even stop going to church. And that is the plan of the devil. Note this, there is the good kind of isolation. The Bible speaks about how Jesus isolated himself for 40 days and 40 nights in order to spend time with God. So there's the good kind of isolation. And then there's the isolation that is born out of loss. Child of God, listen, when you isolate yourself as a result of loss, then the enemy cuts you off from sources of restoration, from sources that could actually stare and stoke your flame again. I know that, I mean, it's, 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 it's an emotion that we all feel when there is loss and, and you just don't want to hear, sometimes, particularly I, I recently lost a loved one, you don't want to hear somebody telling you it's going to get better, you don't want to hear someone telling you um, God will come through for you when you've just experienced major losses. You, you, you know that it's probably true, maybe you do know that it's, that it's the truth, but your, your, your feelings then just don't want to hear it. I want to say this to you, don't give in to the lie of the enemy. Isolation is just the precursor to something worse. You isolate yourself, it compounds your depression, and if you allow that depression to escalate, it will bring thoughts of suicide and, 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 even, and, 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 and its ilk into your space. You don't want to do that. And for today, though, I want to mention about two other things that, that loss brings into our space. Loss has a way, pay attention to this, of redefining our convictions. What do I mean by that? I, I'm dealing with so many people because of a loss in business. They limit what they even want to pursue. And so you're trying to encourage them, let's take a step further, let's push this further. And you can see that they're hesitant. They, they don't want to take the risk anymore because of what they had lost in the past. And so their conviction, they know that maybe they should. They know maybe they should step out in faith. But because of the, the, the previous loss, it has redefined their convictions. It has redefined the pursuit. I'm dealing with individuals who, because of, of, of loss, of a good relationship, they make statements like, 
relationships don't work. All men are dogs. Um, this thing is not for me. And, and, and it redefines their belief systems. You need to be careful. I know what you're going through now might be hell. But don't let it redefine your convictions. Whenever, and, and I wrote this down, I need to say this, our convictions must always be based on truth and not on our experiences. When your experience does not align with truth, and what is truth? Truth is what the Word of God says. I may be sick in my body, but if the truth says I'm healed, I will align my conviction with my truth, with the Word of God, irrespective of how I feel. I know that God can raise the dead, but even if I've tried to raise the dead and the dead did not come back to life, I will not conclude that God does not raise the dead. I will keep my conviction based on truth and not on my experience because if your conviction is based on your experience you become like a roller coaster you will the devil will take you for a ride and a spin and he will dump you off in a coffin somewhere you really don't want to do that do not let your pain redefine your conviction stay hooked on the truth give you give you a scripture in genesis chapter 35 verse 18 Joseph's mother was about to die. She was about to give birth. And as she gave birth, she gave birth to a child. And she named him Benoni. Do you know what Benoni means? It means son of my sorrow. The father was there and, and, and he was about to experience the loss of his wife. And, and he could have said, yes, this was the advent of our sorrow. But no, he took his child and renamed him immediately Benjamin, which is son of my right hand or son of my strength or son of my power. What was, what was Jacob doing there? Jacob was saying, I will not allow my sorrow redefine my convictions. I know that this is a painful moment, but I still serve a God that is still able to bring beauty out of this crisis do not let your your loss redefine your convictions another thing that loss attempts to do is it puts us in a position where if we are not careful it will attempt to deform us what do i mean what do i mean when i say deform us it attempts to cause us to come to a place where we change in our behavior in order to survive the overwhelming negative emotions that we're feeling. So, so we see individuals that begin to do drugs. And when I say drugs, I'm not just talking about illicit drugs. I'm not, just, I'm not talking about LSD, meth, or even cocaine. That is inclusive. But I'm even talking about those who begin to abuse um, pain medication, abuse sleep medication, because, because of the... the, the unresolved, overwhelming negative emotions that they are feeling, we are feeling because of our loss, we begin to find what we call coping mechanisms. And we all have coping mechanisms, but some of our coping strategies become negative. I know of an individual who, because they lost um, a very wonderful marriage, the, their spouse cheated on them. Do you know what they did? They, they began to sleep with every Tom, Dick, and Harry that showed up in their space. Why were they doing this? They were doing this because they were struggling to manage the emotions they were feeling. I know those who begin to go to the bottle and become um, alcoholics because they're trying to medicate their pain. You need to pay attention of the impact, particularly the negative impact loss could have in your space. Is that the time? I'm almost out of it. I want to say this to you, child of God. If you are listening to this and you have chosen and you find yourself experiencing some of these things I've mentioned, cry out for help. Seek help quickly. Call somebody on the phone. Call somebody who knows what they are doing. Call somebody who has a proper encounter with God. Call a professional and let them begin to work you through your brokenness. Do not let the devil capitalize on that loss to bring even greater destruction into your space. God bless you. He will carry you through as he has done in times past. In Jesus' name. This has been Tim Grace, senior pastor of the city of Zion, saying to you, in this year of his spirit, 2023, you will be led by his spirit. Bye for now. Hello, I am... Humphrey Oseni, and I'm really excited to be here sharing God's word. I'm always thrilled to be a blessing to the body of Christ, and we're continuing our series on how 
to have your breakthrough come quickly, speedily? How to see accelerated breakthroughs? Is it possible to see accelerated breakthroughs? Is it even scriptural to see accelerated breakthroughs? I believe it is. A good example is Matthew chapter 8. A centurion, and if you read also the account in Luke, a centurion sends people to tell Jesus that his servant is grievously ill. And he later changed his mind and said, Master, you don't have to come to my house. Hallelujah. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And when those that he sent got back, they saw the servant already healed. Now, if Jesus had to walk all the way to the house, it would have taken longer for the servant to be healed. So the, the centurion's faith, his switch in mindset, his switch in faith, which Jesus Christ said, I have not seen such great faith when he said, speak the word only, caused the servant's healing to happen faster. So what you believe, how you act in faith, can make a big difference in the speed of the manifestation of your miracle. Like we've been reading Isaiah 65, verse 24, it says, God say, God, this is God speaking. He said, before you call, I will answer. Before you call, before they call, I will answer. That word answer means I will respond. God can provide the miracle before you call. Hallelujah. Many years ago, my wife was, it was just a day to her birthday, and she wanted, a, she wanted just to have a bigger birthday. So she thought of calling her sister. You know, let me call my sister, ask her for some money. But the Lord said, why don't you ask me? She heard in her spirit, why don't you ask me? I said, Lord, you know your own. It takes time. We have to meditate. We have to confess that many times to just get that miracle that God will provide supernaturally. She felt it takes time. And the Lord said, where did you get that from? Who told you that I take time? And she said, okay, Lord, I believe, I, I, I believe for a miracle. I believe for a breakthrough for my birthday. And her birthday was the next day. And the next day, we got an alert from the bank. Or actually, it was a call from the bank that some money had been sent to us. What, what exchange rate do we want? And we discovered from the US, this was many years ago in South Africa here, from the US, somebody had sent some money. And when my wife called the lady, and the lady had never sent money from US <laughs> before to South Africa for us. And when my wife called the lady, she said uh, she sent the money three days earlier. So my wife prayed on the 20th, her birthday is on the 21st, and three days, I think, was, is it the 18th, the lady had sent the money. So before she prayed, God had already put it in somebody's heart to send her money. So God is able to answer before you pray. But if she had not prayed, the money would never have been sent. God exists outside time, and God sees the end. He sees that you're going to be in faith. He sees you're going to pray, and God is able to answer, provide, bring your miracle, begin to move before you even pray. And we need to move into this kind of prayer. We need to have this mindset. I tell you, the same thing the Lord did for my wife, he can do for you. The days of delayed prayer are over for you if you will begin to apply this principle. In the book of Ezekiel 12, 28, he says the days have come that the prophecy will not delay. The days have come that your breakthrough will not take time. The days have come that there will be speed. Many, we, 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 we are so inundated with delay. We think delay, we talk delay, we think God has to take time. And that's one of the tools of the devil. I've ministered to Satanists, I've ministered to people in different courts. And one thing some of them have told me is that the, de the devil lures them, fellow Satanists lure people by telling them that God is slow, as is faster. I have not gone to a herbalist before, but people have told me that herbalists tell them, or people go to herbalists because they think their own is fast. God's own takes time. No, God is a God of speed. God can do it fast. I know there are some things that have to take time. You can't get your degree in medicine in two years. You have to take the five years or six years or seven years. Depends on the medical school. But you know, some people take 10 years. Why should you take 10 years when the normal thing is seven years? And God can accelerate miracles. I'm not talking of education, but God can make things happen faster. When Jesus turned water to wine, why didn't he say or expect it to take three hours, four hours, even a day or two days? Jesus got them to have the miracle immediately. He said, go take, the wa take water from the pots and take it to the leader of the feast. Hallelujah. 
and it happened that quickly. Why didn't Jesus do the miracle in six hours? It would have still been a miracle if the water was turned to wine in six hours, because to get wine, to go plant the seed, the grapes to grow, to crush the wine, to keep them, will take years to get very good wine, maybe 20 years, 25 years, but Jesus was able to get that miracle to happen just in a few minutes. Beloved of God, God is a God of speed. A woman was bound 18 years, and this was the Sabbath day. And Jesus prayed and said, woman that loosed, Luke 13, verse 12. And immediately she was straightened up. Now the head of the synagogue said, why don't you wait a day? You can heal her on the next day. Why must you heal her on the Sabbath day? Because God hates delay. I said, God hates delay. Jesus wasn't ready to wait one more day. He said, ought not this one who was bound 18 years. Maybe you've been in your problem for 18 years. And when you encounter Jesus, the God of miracles, the God of speed, just like the woman in the issue of love, Mark chapter 5, verse 25, there was a certain woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and was nothing better but rather good worse. When she heard about Jesus, she said, when I touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And as soon as she touched the, the garment, she knew immediately that the issue of blood, the flow had stopped. Immediately, immediately, hallelujah. Jesus is the God of the immediately. He's a God of suddenlies. I know you might have had delays, but we need to change our perspective. We need to change our mindset. We need to begin to say it's happening now. You know, many times what we do is that we even confess delay. Ah, these things take long. This is so slow. Why is it so slow? When you do that, you are enforcing the spirit of delay. You are giving him more power. What should I do, man of God? Start saying it's happening fast for me. Even when it looks as if it's slow, it's happening fast. My miracle comes fast. Things always happen fast for me. Speed is my portion. This is a year of acceleration. Keep on declaring acceleration because Jesus said in Mark 11, 23, you have what you say if you believe it. God bless you because this is your year for speed. This is your year for quick manifestations. This is your year for promotion. God bless you and keep on living a life of victory. Welcome again to Francis. This is Dr. Julius from Hope Baptist Church. It's a pleasure to have you again in our space this day. What a blessing, what a blessing, what a blessing to have this topic discussed. Which topic is a topic of marriage? I've been discussing on the series the A, B, and the C of marriage. You can repeat with me, the A, the B, and the C of marriage. We talked about marriage being an institution which was ordained by God. God instituted marriage and he meant it to reflect the covenant relationship that the church has with Christ. And God also wants marriage to be a weapon in the very end time, in the transformation of lives. And so we, we're discussing on this very important topic. We talked about the A being acknowledging God in your marriage. You must acknowledge God in your marriage. You must acknowledge your spouse in your marriage. You must acknowledge your children in your marriage. We talked about a B being faithful. Number one, to God, be faithful to God, which is triggered by the fear of God, but be faithful to your spouse also. In your emotional life, be faithful. In your financial life, be faithful. But you might be asking yourself the question, what about the C? The C is all about communication. Communication. Communication is such a topic that we can't so much exhaust we just will unravel today, but we can't exhaust communication. Communication is a life wire also of marriage. Number one, communication with God. It starts with God. Communication with God is very important. The time you invest in prayer, the time you invest in intimacy, quality time, in your personal prayer life, in communicating with God, will reflect also in your marriage. In fact, let me tell you something. The less you meet God in prayer, you communicate with God, the more you will be very much uncomfortable communicating even with your spouse. So the only way to revitalize your communication means with your spouse will be you spending quality time communicating with God. So the C is communicating with God first, but the flip side of that coin is communicating with one another. Communication in marriage is a whole therapy, but I want to believe that if you trust the Spirit of God, He will give you the right words at the right time, the right disposition to be able to communicate. Because communication, according to the University of California, 
80% of what we communicate is non-verbal. 80% of what we communicate, according to the University of California, is non-verbal, which means that only 20% is verbal. So a lot of the non-verbal communication goes with our moods, facial expression, our tones, and sometimes that's why you have to repeat something before your wife will understand you. <laughs> you understand because the depth about it is not what you are saying, it's what she's listening. And so the Bible says in James 1, 19, that we should be slow to speak, but quick to listen. God has given us two ears and one mouth. Why? Because the ability for us to hear should be higher and greater than speaking. Do you know that the power of life and death lies in the tongue? And so whatever you communicate without reflection, without thoughtful consideration, might go to hurt somebody. I'm talking to somebody now, you just might be hurt by your spouse, you might be hurt by your husband or your wife, but please look for every means by the grace of God to forgive. Communication is very crucial. I want to summarize a little bit. I, I must acknowledge Gary Chapman. Gary Chapman wrote a book which is called The Five Love Languages. And this just might be the summary which we are extrapolating today to, to highlight on communication. It's by no means exhaustive. It is one of the tools which, among many others, might be referenced or recommended in terms of communication. And Gary Chapman writes this. He says, number one, key component of love language in marriage in communication is their words of affirmation. We must use words of affirmation. You must be able to identify your husband or your wife if they fall within any of these categories. But words of affirmation might just be a word to encourage somebody for a job well done. Your husband comes back to the house and he's so tired after the hustles and bustles of life and everything has happened around his face and he just needs a word of encouragement than the batching. If ever you identify that your husband has a proclivity and inclination towards doing more and loving you more when you affirm him, then affirm him, <laughs> then affirm him, use those words to affirm him because you are triggering his love language by affirming him. It might be vice versa also for, for, your, for your wife if you see that as a key point to encourage her. But number two, he said the second love language are acts of service. Acts of service are acts you get involved with, the chores of the house you get involved with helping somebody alongside, getting into the kitchen while she's cooking and making sure that you are alongside her to support her. You just might not know that that will trigger a love relationship uh, in, in your very space of, of marriage. Uh, you just might be out there also to assist her while she's so much multitasking. She, she has to wash the place, she has to cook, but she meets you cleaning the floor and you will not know that that's her love language and you trigger a love situation in her and she starts understanding that in fact this man loves me. But apart from words of affirmation, apart from acts of service, Gary Chapman also says there's a receiving of gifts. We are not talking of buying your wife a car or surprising her with an exorbitant gift. It just might be bringing a bouquet of flour to the house, buying her chocolate, just surprising her one day with just a bar of chocolate. You might not know that it will trigger, it might just trigger again a love relationship in that marriage. But he says, number four, quality time, quality time. Among the two of you, there is one person who really wants quality time. And quality time does not mean watching TV. It means turning off TV, turning off your cell phone, and really spending quality time with this woman. She does not want to hear your voice only. She wants to hear your heart beat for her. And so quality time is very important. But the last one, as I conclude, the last one is touch. 
and one of you might so much be open to the romantic touch. When you touch him, it's not sexually, but it's just the proximity and the affection, and they feel also that they are loved. So I'm summarizing this because communication is very complex, but I am summarizing to say God can help you in your communication journey with your wife, with your husband. The most important is spend time communicating with God it will be much more easier you communicating with one another. Thank you very much. It's been the A, the B, and the C of marriage. I pray that God is going to bless your marriage relationship. He's going to fire it anew, and he's going to use it as a great, great model for many other marriages in your church, in your family, and in your community. God bless you. We'll come your way again next time. This has been Dr. Julia signing out on Francis. God bless you. Bye. Praise God. You've heard the word of God today and you're making a decision. I want my life to change. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. He wants to come in. Pray this simple prayer with me today and Jesus Christ will come into your heart, save you and give you eternal life. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you. I open my heart and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, save me. Wash me in your blood. Give me eternal life. From today, I will serve you as you live in me. In Jesus' name. Well, congratulations. You've come into the kingdom of God. You're a new creation. We love you and we believe you'll grow in Christ and discover who you are as a child of God. God bless you.